Welcome to the seventh and the last lecture of the Paraspar webinar series Journey of Discovery in Science. Uh, this is the seventh lecture and this is the this is going to be the last one in this series and from the uh, next month onwards we're going to begin another series that we'll uh, announce shortly. Paraspar is an initiative by the Office of Communication IIC to open discussions about knowledge systems, particularly in science. Most of you who have attended uh, you know, the, the lectures before must be knowing this already. In this uh, lecture series, we discuss the backstory of science uh, to open up the discussions about how scientific discoveries are made, to, the processes, the methodologies, and even the failures and struggles. Most often, we only you know talk about the you know the product, but the methodologies or the you know, struggle behind is hardly discussed. So this was an effort from our side to you know talk about the methodologies, the processes, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, you know the entire narrative of how a scientific discovery is made. So today, uh, as uh, we have uh, Dr. Hari Sridhar, uh, who is going to speak about uh, the, the topic is reading between the lines of a scientific paper. Naim revisits Naim et al. in 1994. So before we begin uh, the la this lecture, because it is the last one in this series, I would like to summarize what we have done so far. So we have had six lectures before this. Uh, the first one was by uh, Professor B. Anantanarayan, uh, who is a physicist, and he spoke about the joy of discovery in modern research. His talk discussed how modern research is a complex activity that calls for a wide knowledge training and teamwork. He discussed some anecdotes from history of science and proceeded to, to the modern age and discussed the trajectories of some of the recent important discoveries. Then we had Professor Anandita Bhadra, who is a behavioral biologist. She spoke on making animals tell their stories. In her talk, she traced the journeys of the scientists probing into the private lives of animals, telling some of their the stories behind the science and touching upon the science uh, that the stories unraveled. Then third lecture was by Professor Prajwal Shastri, uh, who is an astrophysicist. She, she spoke on uh, the hunt for the heftiest things we know. In her talk, she spoke about the heaviest thing that we know in the universe, the black holes. She discussed questions how we uh, know that, uh, this were some of the questions she discussed, that how we know that the black holes are for real, how we find them, uh, how did we find them, uh, why are they important. She spoke about all these questions through the story of the discovery. The fourth lecture was by Dr. Anish Mukashi, uh, who is a physicist uh, and a uh, you know, person who uh, is into history of science. He spoke how a Dane in Paris chanced upon the speed of light and other stories from the heaven and earth. Uh, his talk unfolded the story of how researchers calculated the speed of light. In addition to this, he touched upon who were these researchers, what were they looking for, how did they go about their work, uh, what technology or artisanal skills uh, did they possess, how did they collaborate uh, and learn from each other. This kind of questions were discussed in his talk. Then we had a lecture by Professor Sudarshan Ayengar, who is a computer scientist. He spoke about uh, what big data can tell us about the origin of scientific knowledge. So he, in his talk, he talked about how does knowledge emerge? Uh, is it, a, it is, it, does it come sudden or is it incremental? While this, um, this question is, uh, he said that this question is uh, age old, but what does the modern you know, research big data can tell us uh, about these questions? So in, this, in his lectures, he talked about, uh, you know, touched upon these issues. Last week, we had Professor Pankaj Sheksaria, who works in the area of uh, STS, Science, Technology and Society. He spoke about even at the Nano School, society's deep impact on science, technology and innovations in India. Drawing from, from his six years research across five nanoscale and technology laboratories in three cities of India, he presented the simultaneous stories of this lab and also the story of his own journey through this lab. He also discussed his research on making of the earliest scanning tunneling microscope in India. So we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Hari Sridhar today, who is the alumnus of uh, IISC, and he's, as, a, uh, as, we, as you know, he's going to talk uh, to us about reading between uh, the lines of a scientific paper, Naim Revisits Naim et al. 1994. Dr. Hari Sridhar is an independent researcher and an honorary fellow at the archives at National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. He is also a visiting fellow at Zukun uh, College Contents. I am sure Hari will correct me on this. Uh, Hari is interested in documentary and interpreting the making of ecological uh, knowledge and its intersections with conservation practice. During his PhD and initial postdoctoral years at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, Hari's research was aimed at understanding the causes and consequences of mixed species animal group 
and interest that he continues to pursue independently and through collaborative projects. In addition to the project he is going to talk about, uh, Hari is also co-leading a project that aims to document the making of conservation in India over the last 50 years. So over to you, Hari. Thank you, Bitasta. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, thank you, and I'd also like to thank the um, IIC Communications Office for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank all the people who are attending. Uh, you know, the last thing that uh, you need at this point in time is probably another webinar. So I'm very happy to see so many people here, and uh, I hope it's worth your while. Um, let me just try and share this. Okay, can you see the presentation? Uh, yeah, we can see. We can see. Okay, thank you, Bitasta. Okay, uh, so like uh, Bitasta mentioned, I'm uh, mainly an independent researcher now, but I also am affiliated um, to the archives at the National Center for Biological Sciences and to an institute called Zukunftskolleg in Konstanz in Germany. Um, and, um, you know, the theme of uh, this talk series, Parasper, is to, in some sense, shift the emphasis in conversations about science from talking about the final products of science to the journeys leading up to the final product. And uh, I'm going to engage with this theme by talking about a, a very concrete material final product of science, which is the scientific paper. Now, uh, scientists... Uh, Hari, if I might... Uh, yeah? you, know, uh, the, you might want to put it in full screen. It's not in full screen. Okay, it's in full screen for me. Let me just try again. Okay. Uh, what about now? No, not yet. Do you see yes, the full yes. screen now? Yes, yes. So, Samira, thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, no sorry about that. Um, I don't remember where I stopped, but I'll anyway, I'll start again. Okay, so I think I was saying that. Um, you know, I want to engage with the theme of this talk series by focusing on one, you know, specific final product of uh, science, which is the scientific paper. Um, now, scientists do many different things. They, you know, they invent things, they unravel patterns about the world, they uh, make predictions about the future, they model the world. Uh, but no matter, you know, the approach that scientists take to the questions they ask, one feature that's universal to all scientists is that they finally publish their work in the form of a scientific paper. You know, especially today, um, scientific papers, writing scientific papers sort of central uh, to the scientists' working life. Scientists are compared, evaluated, and awarded based on the papers they write, how many they write, where they are published, uh, how often they are cited. Um, and uh, while there is a lot of debate about whether this is uh, a good thing or not. Of course, it's important that scientists communicate their work, publish their work, because they're often funded by uh, other people. Very few scientists fund their own work. So it's important to justify what they've done with the money. It's also important to communicate what they found to other scientists and to the general public. But uh, like it's usually said, you know, too much of a good thing can be unhealthy. And so there's a lot of debate on whether this uh, emphasis on scientific publication, that scientists are evaluated only based on their publications, whether that is healthy or not. Uh, and uh, this debate takes many different forms. For instance, there are questions about, you know, plagiarism and fabrication of data in science. There are questions about what perverse incentives this emphasis on publication creates. Um, whether most fundamentally, you know, whether people are even able to keep track of all the publications, whether they're able to read adequately within their disciplines. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, really uh, valuable discussion and debate about these topics um, in a variety of fora. I'm not going to talk about these larger issues with and larger problems with scientific publishing, uh, but I'm instead in this talk going to focus on, you know, the form and content of the scientific paper itself, right? Um, and, you know, Pitasta said that um, in these talks, there might both be people who are practitioners of science, but also people who are maybe just interested in science, but are not practitioners of science themselves. So just to give people a sense of what uh, a scientific paper is, uh, I just thought I'll you know, very quickly go through 
you know what a scientific paper looks like so typically uh, the scientific paper especially the modern scientific paper is organized in the following fashion you know it starts with a title that either describes what was attempted or what was found it's followed by the author's names and affiliations uh, and then there is a, a brief summary of the paper where different parts of the paper are briefly summarized in a line or two uh, this is then followed by an introduction where the authors lay out the broad area within which they're working, uh, you know, the gaps in this understanding and then try and uh, justify how they are trying to fill that gap. Um, this is then followed by a section called the methods where, uh, you know, the procedures used, the materials used and the assumptions being made are laid out. Uh, following the methods, the scientists, uh, the authors talk about what they found. Uh, this is usually done in the form of you know, quantitative, uh, either in the form of tables or figures, often supported with statistics to sort of uh, justify uh, their findings. Hari, you got muted. Hari, you got muted. Uh, hey, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Okay, I, no, the, I, there was a message that said I've been muted, but yeah, I just unmuted myself. Um, so after the results, there's a section called the discussion where whatever the, was found in that study is interpreted. Uh, it's then compared to earlier research on the topic. It's compared and contrasted to earlier research on the topic. And what's also really important in, in the discussion is where um, the authors sort of anticipate uh, what might be the criticisms of this piece of work and try and um, you know counter those criticisms. Um, and then finally, you know, the paper ends with uh, a section called the acknowledgements where uh, people who have helped uh, with uh, the making of this study and the paper are thanked. Uh, usually this also includes funding agencies. And finally, there is a section where all the literature that's been cited in the paper, you know, of earlier work is um, is listed. Right. Um, what's important to note also in relation to the scientific paper especially the modern scientific paper, is that there is this highly formalized and stylized way of writing the paper. And this is uh, imposed quite strictly by the journals. And the style is more or less universal, irrespective of which journal uh, you look at, you know, with minor modifications. Sometimes the results and the discussions might be together. Um, but most of the time, this is the this is the structure followed. And the reason why um, there is this highly formal structure uh, is because uh, the emphasis of the paper really is to communicate the findings and its in interpretations in as clear a way as possible uh, without any distraction. So the idea is really to get the let the reader evaluate for himself or herself whether the findings hold true and whether the interpretations hold true based on the findings. Right. And so that is the emphasis of the paper. Now, um, you know, what this has also meant, this highly formalized and structure of the paper has meant, uh, what that has meant is that a lot of the details about how the science is actually done uh, often gets left out, right? So if you go as early as 1964, uh, there is this paper by Peter Medawar. Peter Medawar is a, a British biochemist, uh, best known for his work on, you know, how tissue graphs are rejected uh, when transplanted and based on which he discovered the phenomenon of acquired immunotolerance for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize, I think, in 1960. Uh, but in addition to his uh, scientific research, he was also really well known for uh, his uh, books that communicated science to a larger audience. And in these books, he is he tried to really talk about uh, how science is done, you know, the process of science itself. And in 1964, he gave a talk to the BBC titled is the scientific paper of fraud. Now, this title was deliberately provocative. Medawar was not suggesting that uh, scientists are deliberately, uh, you know, fabricating or plagiarizing uh, their findings. He was not even suggesting that they are misinterpreting the, their findings, but what he was wanted to say really was that the scientific paper uh, in the way in which it's structured is gives a somewhat misleading narrative of 
the processes that go into the making of these discoveries, right? And he was focusing on mainly the processes of thought. And so it's important to remember that Peter Medawar was writing in the 1960s and the scientific paper has changed quite a lot since then. Uh, what Peter Medawar was commenting about was how the way in which papers are written, it seems as if scientists make their observations uh, completely unprejudiced, unbiased, just based on what their senses tell them. And from a collection of these findings, they come up with a theory about how the world works. And Peter Meta was saying that, of course, this is not true, right? All scientists go into a study with some, some expectation, right? So this inductive structure of the paper uh, is a misrepresentation of how scientific discoveries are made. And uh, from the time of Peter Medawar, a number of other people have uh, spoken about the problems with the scientific paper. You know, what is it that the scientific paper does to the journey of discovery itself? And what's interesting is that today, the scientific paper is in fact written very differently from the time of Peter Medawar, right? Most scientific papers are structured uh, in a way in which you first present the background and the hypothesis being tested and the background, and then from that, how you know your ideas are derived. But uh, what's ironic is that today, papers have a problem, which is in some sense the counter to what Medawar was uh, suggesting in the 1960s. Today, everything is structured as if there is a theory and hypothesis in mind to start with, but very often, uh, you know, ideas for a study come from, say, a natural history observation uh, or some other accidental observation, and then the theory is imposed on it post hoc. So while it is still true that there are problems with the scientific paper, it's important to remember that the problems that Medawar was pointing out are quite different from the problems that the other more recent people have been pointing out, right? Uh, in addition to this problem, uh, others have also been pointing out how scientific papers leave out, you know, many aspects of the process of discovery. Science involves, you know, false starts. It involves uh, serendipitous discovery. It involves uh, accidents, it involves failed experiments, but all of this is left out when the paper is finally written. And uh, if you have to put it in, in sort of one sentence, all these uh, earlier uh, people who are talking about this are talking about a gap between what scientists actually do and how they present what they do. And uh, this was, you know, part of my to start a project about four or five years ago to try and uh, document the backstories of uh, papers in my own area of research, which is ecology and evolution. But this was only part of the motivation. And you know, in keeping with the spirit of what I'm talking about today, uh, which is really the true stories with, behind any of these studies, uh, part of my motivation was also uh, you know, a sense of discomfort that came with uh, the papers that I was writing myself. So what you see on the screen is the a paper I published from my PhD, the first pa paper I published from my PhD, and uh, which was published in 2009. And uh, a little while after that, maybe a couple of years after that, when I went back to read the paper, I found that you know I couldn't, in some sense, identify with what, what was being said in the paper because what was being said in the paper was so distant from how I actually went about. Uh, you know, doing the study that led up to this paper, right? There was, there were at least a couple of cases where a chance discovery of a book in the library was crucial to what I did during the study. The collaboration with the second author on this paper, Guy Beauchamp, came out entirely by chance. It came out with just an email I'd sent him asking for a reprint. And so all of this got left out. What to me were the most crucial aspects of this, the making of the study. And uh, so partly driven by this personal motivation and partly by, you know, other discussions about uh, the problem to the scientific paper, I decided to start a project that uh, was, you know, trying to capture the backstories of, you know, well-known papers in ecology and evolution. And the project, the website, which all these uh, interviews are found is, uh, is called Reflections on Papers Past. And uh, so far I've done about um, 160 interviews of which about 112 I think are on the website now. And uh, what I'm going to try and do uh, in this talk is to use one paper from this collection as a case study to really demonstrate this gap between what scientists do and what 
how they present what they do. And uh, the paper I picked for this is uh, it's titled Declining Biodiversity Can Alter the Performance in e of Ecosystems. This was a paper that was published in Nature in 1994. And it is a paper that's believed to be uh, mark the start of an, a, a new discipline within ecology, which is the, the study of the relationships between biodiversity and ecosystem function, right? Um, for people who might not be familiar, uh, let me just briefly tell you what those terms mean. Biodiversity, very crudely put, can be thought of as the sum total of all the species present in an area and the interactions between these species, right? Uh, and ecosystem function is the sort of the physiochemical and biological processes that uh, occur in the, that area uh, in relation to the biodiversity, right? Um, and um, what the study was trying to do is to see if ecosystem function, these processes, uh, change as a result of biodiversity. As you go from, say, low to medium to high biodiversity, does the function itself change, right? And this was done in a place called Silwood Park in uh, Imperial College in London, in which there was a setup called the Ecotron. What you see on the left is uh, a line of growth chambers within the, this larger building is called the Ecotron. And uh, each of these growth chambers, uh, you know, allows the scientists to maintain ambient conditions, air, light, humidity, water availability, uh, allows them to set these conditions as they want, uh, if they want to set the same conditions in all the growth chambers. And within this, to do experiments with uh, artificially created biological communities. So what you see on the, light, on the left is a series of uh, growth chambers. And what you see on the right is the interior of one of those growth chambers where there is an artificially created biological community, right? Um, and so what these scientists did was to set up, you know, such communities at three different uh, levels of biodiversity. So let me just explain very briefly what the scheme is. In this diagram, um, each circle represents a species. Uh, the black circles are species that were present in all three treatments, high, medium, and low. The dotted circles are ones that were present only in high and medium uh, treatments and the blank circles are ones that were present only in the high treatment. And so what you see here is a set of species of different trophic levels, which means there are predators, there are uh, prey of the predators, then there are uh, plants and there are decomposers. And the links between them, the lines between them indicate that they are interacting, right? So there are both what are called trophic interactions if they are lines between species that are present at different trophic levels and interactions within species at the same level. And so what the scientists did was as they went from high to medium to low, they removed a set of species. So medium had a subset of the species present in the high treatment, low had a subset of species present in the medium and high treatments and so on. And so they set up these, these communities and then within them, they measured ecosystem function to see if ecosystem function varies depending on you know what the level of biodiversity is. Uh, so just to show that to you visually, so you on the x-axis you have three different treatments, high, medium, and low, and on the y-axis they measured some measure of ecosystem function. This could be you know the productivity of the system, which is the amount of biomass produced in the system, or how well does this community retain water in the soil, uh, and so on, right? And the general finding, of course, there is a lot of uh, nuance to this, but for this purpose of this talk, it's in, enough to say that the overall finding was that ecosystem function actually varies with biodiversity. In some cases, it was a positive relationship, meaning as you go from low to high, the measure of ecosystem function also varied positively and so on. So, but, but there was variation for the different functions, but the overall finding is that ecosystem does vary with biodiversity. And this is, was important at that time because it was the first sort of experimental demonstration that ecosystem function varies with biodiversity. And like I said, this led to the birth of this field of inquiry called biodiversity ecosystem function research. Uh, and now there are you know thousands of research groups all over the world that are uh, working within this area of research. So 
in 2016, what I did was to, when Shahid Naeem visited Bangalore, he visited the National Center for Biological Sciences, I decided to interview him about this paper, the paper published in 1994. So in this uh, slide, you see this is a photo of Shahid Naeem uh, around 1994 when he did the study, and this was a more recent photo. And so I asked Shahid Naeem about questions related to the making of this paper, uh, questions that addressed at finding out what was left out of the paper specifically. Um, and so I just want to give you a few excerpts from these interviews to really contrast what is said in the paper and how the study was actually done. Right. Um, so the Um, so let's start. So the first thing I want to talk about is the, you know, the background or motivation to the study. Like I was saying earlier, that the scientific paper, especially the modern scientific paper, uh, usually starts with a section that presents the motivation to do the study. And typically, it has, you could think of it as having three parts. In the first part, uh, marked by these arrows, um, the authors try and establish the, the large research area within which they are working. So the sentence that maybe captures that the best for this paper is the second sentence. Currently, most ecosystems are experiencing loss of biodiversity associated with the activities of human expansion, raising the issue of whether the biogeochemical functioning of ecosystems will be impaired by this loss of species. So that sets the broad area, the broad context for the study. Within that, papers typically in the next section, next sentence, identify some gap in understanding, some something that's not known about this large area. And in this case, uh, what they're saying is that there are few empirical tests about this, this larger research area, you know, whether there is an association between biodiversity and ecosystem function. And typically, in the third part of these introductions, the scientist usually lays out how they are trying to fill that niche, as you will see from the sentence in shown here. Uh, they say here we provide evidence from experiments that biodiversity in fact affects the performance of ecosystems. So this is typically how scientific papers are organized in terms of the introduction. And this uh, paper by Naeem is a, is a classic example. But in the interview, I asked uh, Shahid Naeem what, what his motivation, personal sort of motivation to do this study was. And this is what he had to say. And I'll give you half a minute to maybe read that. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, so Shahid Naim says, we first thought we will do a global warming experiment in the ecotron, set up some chambers at ambient temperature, some a little bit warmer, some even warmer, and measure the artificially created biological communities. So what's interesting is the plan from the beginning was not to do an experiment testing the relationship of biodiversity and ecosystem function. What they in fact wanted to do was test the relationship of environmental features, temperature in particular, and how biodiversity responds to temperature. Uh, then he goes on to say that, but around the same time, the Earth Summit happened in Rio. Uh, and one important outcome of that summit was the recognition of biological diversity as the underlying foundation of sustainable development. So what this is around in 1992, there was this really important UN summit uh, that happened in Rio and Brazil where uh, it was also the start of what is called the Convention on Biological Diversity. There was also a lot of discussion around climate change and global warming. But one important outcome of, was that, of that uh, summit was the recognition of the link between sustainable development and biological diversity. Right? And then finally, he says that you know, around this time that John Lawton, who was his postdoc supervisor, asked him to read an, uh, an article that he had written for a symposium on the topic of whether biodiversity mattered. And John Lawton was actually arguing that it didn't matter. And really, so this, this really strong personal feeling, you know, counter to what his postdoc supervisor was suggesting, that biodiversity did not matter for ecosystem function, that really motivated Shahid Naim to want to do this experiment. And so instead of doing the experiment they originally proposed, they decided to do a different experiment. And just to show you that visually, in the initial idea, Biodiversity was actually on the y axis. It was the response they were interested in measuring, right, in relation to temperature. But uh, what happened eventually, what they actually tested was putting biodiversity on the x axis, which is biodiversity is the variable that's the predictor variable, and looking at how ecosystem function varied in relation to biodiversity. 
Um, I'd like, I'd like to now talk about you know, the methods in the paper. You, typically in scientific papers, uh, methods are described briefly. They are, dis they are expected to be described in enough detail for the study to be replicated, um, which while on paper is usually the case, what you know, most scientists know from their own experience uh, is that what is written on the paper is not often directly translatable into what you do in the field, right? It's like, for instance, um, a chef putting down a recipe, but not telling you the uh, sort of the slates of hand that actually make the dish happen, right? So I'd like to again point out one such instance in the paper um, where they mention that the photo period, right? So remember, these are growth chambers. These are conducted inside a room. And what they're doing is that they're changing the uh, environmental conditions to replicate what is happening out in the field, right? So they want to mimic, uh, you know, day and night. So they set up these experiments with a photo period of about 16 hours um, and also a gradual dusk and dawn duration of one hour, right? That's all the detail that's provided in the paper itself. But in the interview, uh, Shahid Naim talks about how, you know, these, what they actually did in these experiments, right? So he says, Richard Woodfin was concerned that fluorescent lights flickered, which we can't see, but insects can. He said we got to use quartz halogens because quartz halogens don't flicker. But of course, quartz halogens get very hot, so we had to devise a system to remove the infrared heat. He also said that a lot of animals respond to the shift between red and far red to the that it's dawn or dusk. He insisted that we shift the red to far red during our experiment. So you can see that there is a lot of other detail, you know, all, a lot of you know, craft involved in setting up these experiments, which have got completely left out of the paper itself, right? Um, to give you another example, um, in the paper, there is the line that plant and animal diversity was manipulated to create low, intermediate, and high diversity microcosms with 9, 15, and 31 species. So like I was saying, there are three treatments, low, intermediate, and high diversity. And so what they had to create were these artificial biological communities, right? What they call microcosms. Uh, but there is no detail provided of how they decided how to, what species to use in these microcosms. There are lists of species, but you don't know how they actually chose these species itself. And so when I asked Shahid Naim about that, he says that for a couple of years before the experiments, we tried out lots of candidate species in a mock chamber and picked the ones that survived best. We chose what John Lawton used to call the VD Meadow as the model for our community, a patchwork community with all the ingredients. It wasn't nature in a bottle, rather it was all the processes of nature in a bottle. And what, what he means by the, the last sentence is that, you know, the communities they created weren't really any communities that were found naturally, right? They took together species, put together species that were maybe not found in nature, but they recreate the processes that goes towards making these communities. And another interesting tip about how these experiments was conducted, he says that when working in the chambers, we had to be really careful about making sure we always went from low to medium to high diversity and not the other way around. If we went from high to low, there was the risk that you would take species from the high diversity community and introduce it into the low diversity treatments. So they wore these hazmat suits and slippers whenever they were in the chambers, right? Because remember that the low diversity community communities contain a subset of diversity communities. So when you go from low to high, there really isn't a problem because all the species present in low are also present in high. But when you go in the reverse direction, there is the risk that you a species from the high diversity community might, you know, sort of lodge onto the scientist and this might then enter the low diversity community. So this came out when I was doing the interview, but found no mention when in the paper itself. So uh, just to give you, a, I mean, this is not from Naeem's paper, but I, I really wanted to show this photo and just to sort of highlight the contrast between what is in the paper and what actually happens. So this is a paper about food sharing in the vampire bat. Um, and in the paper, uh, all that you see are three words, focal animal sampling, right? That's all there is in terms of description of what was done in the field. 
But when I asked Gerald Wilkinson, who wrote this paper, about what focal animal sampling involved, um, he shared with me this photograph. So what you see in the photograph is a researcher who's lying in the hollow of a tree. And what you can't see is that the researcher is looking upwards with a pair of binoculars at the bats that are roosting within this hollow, right? And making notes. So he, the researcher is call, will call out from there what he or she is observing, and somebody sitting outside on that chair would take notes. And uh, Wilkinson also talks about how they had to wear these masks because there was a risk of you know, disease from the bats, of the bat uh, droppings falling on the researcher. And so there is a lot of detail involved in how this was actually done, but it's completely missing from the paper itself. Um, so this paper, the going back to Naeem's paper, it had uh, five authors. And uh, what you usually don't find in published scientific papers is any description of what each author brought to the paper. Some journals will have a small section where they very briefly describe the contributions of each author, but uh, most journals do not have this description. So you all you have is a list of names and you really don't know what each of these authors brought to this paper or how these authors came together. We already saw a little bit about what Richard Woodfin did. Uh, he was an, an engineer who also knew a lot about uh, biology, and you could, we, we saw an example of how his contribution was really important. Uh, the second and third author, Lindsay Thompson and Sharon Lawler, were also postdocs uh, on this study. John Lawton was the supervisor. But what is also interesting during the course of the interview was that Shahid Naim mentioned that the original paper that they submitted to the journal had uh, you know, a number of other authors, a number of other engineers and technicians who were on the paper who were also included as authors, but the journal asked, or actually asked them to leave out these people because they said that they're just technicians, they're just feeling, uh, doing a particular job and uh, their contribution does not qualify for authorship. Right? So this is an interesting detail about the history of this paper that you don't get from reading the paper itself. Uh, and like I was saying, finally, papers have a section called the acknowledgments where people who have helped with the study in some way are uh, thanked or acknowledged. Uh, but again, you know, very often journals, you'll see journals say that try and keep the acknowledgments as brief as possible, right? And that is usually the case that people just either thank people without really telling you what they did or tell you very briefly what they did. So what I try and do in all the interviews is to try and find out more about each of these individuals and how he or she contributed to the study. And again, I'd like to talk just about one example, um, Jay Grover, where uh, the paper says Jay Grover was thanked for advice on the experimental and statistical design. Um, and when in speaking to Shahid Naeem, uh, what I discovered was that this person made a really, really crucial contribution to the design of these experiments. So Jay Grover told them that when you have these three different treatments, high, medium, and low, uh, you know, make sure that you don't have the same number of replicates for high, medium, and low. Have more replicates for the high diversity treatments because there's likely to be more variation within these treatments. And Shahid Naeem says that that was a really, really important piece of advice because it was in fact true that there was more variation. And it was good that right from the beginning we had uh, you know, a larger number of replicates for the higher diversity treatments as compared to the lower diversity treatments. So again, this is a really important, this played a really important part in the making of the study, but you find no mention of it in the paper itself. And finally, you know, there are people who's, who have had a very strong sort of intellectual influence on the paper who are not only not authors, but are not even acknowledged in the paper. So throughout the interview, um, not acknowledged, may, maybe, you know, sort of rightfully so, because they haven't really contributed directly to the making of this paper. But throughout my interview with Shahid Naeem, uh, the names of Rob Colwell and David Sloan Wilson, especially Rob Colwell, came up quite a few times. Rob Colwell was Shahid Naeem's PhD supervisor, uh, which was, this, this paper was done when Shahid Naeem was a postdoc, but earlier he did his PhD with Rob Colwell. And Shahid Naeem talks about how really, you know, the their intellectual influence uh, on his thinking in terms of thinking about interactions between species and trophic interactions. That was really why he felt so strongly that, you know, biodiversity has to have an effect on ecosystem function. So that 
their intellectual influence was really strong in want motivating him to want to do this experiment right so there are these other influences that are an important part of the history of these projects that often don't figure in these papers itself um so finally you know in in these papers you'll see sort of hidden somewhere uh details about you know when the paper was received at the journal and when it was accepted so this paper was submitted on the 2nd of december 1993 and it was accepted on the 28th of march 1994 right and the reason this is important is that very often the paper can change quite dramatically from the time when it was submitted to the time when it was accepted as it goes through the process of what's called peer review based on the reviewer suggestions based on the editor suggestions the paper undergoes a lot of change so what you finally see as the published paper is in fact has a very strong influence of people who are not authors on the paper itself um, right uh, this paper howard was from what shahid naim said was uh, this wasn't the case right he said and, and and the other thing that can happen is that you know a paper might not be accepted in the first journal it's submitted to so there is also that a number of other journals that a paper might have gone to where it either was reviewed or rejected without review and so all of those papers those peer reviews influences are also felt in the final published paper but in this case uh, shahid naim said that nature was the first journal they submitted to and it went through review quite smoothly but what's interesting is he talks a little bit about how you know the politics of wording was really important and for this his postdoc supervisor john lawton's uh, involvement was crucial because john lawton was someone who by this time had already uh, written a lot published a lot he was a well established scientist so he had a sense of what it might take to get a pub paper published in nature and he says interestingly so that when writing a nature paper you need to get as close to the edge of saying that you found something dramatic but you can't cross the line you can't overdo it you can't oversell your result and as an example he points to the last line of the paper where they say to the extent that loss of plant biodiversity in the real world means a reduction of the ability of ecosystems to fix carbon dioxide we also tentatively conclude that the loss of diversity may reduce the ability of so what he is doing here is uh, taking this very very sort of limited finding in these tiny growth chambers where they found a link between biodiversity and the ability of ecosystems to fix carbon dioxide and sort of tentatively speculating that if this is true in these growth chambers maybe it's also true in the larger world that the loss of diversity may affect the ability of ecosystems to absorb anthropogenic carbon dioxide so that which is a really really important finding but it's sort of couched in very very careful guarded language right um so just to summarize what we've just gone through uh, you know we tried to look at the the contrast between what is there in the published paper and what is not left out of the published paper and what we learned about by speaking to the first author and uh, to summarize what we just learned what the paper leaves out the true motivation for the study why you know the authors decided to do the study the the fact that they earlier had a different idea for this experiment and then changed it based on what shahid naim read uh it in some sense leaves out the tricks of the experimental trade it tells you in what was done but what it actually takes to do those things um you know in the lab you know what are the sort of innovations and creativity that doing these experiments requires is left out of the paper itself and uh, very often contributions of the people involved is not described uh, in detail so you get the sense that you know the authors are very very important and the other people who are acknowledged contributed in in a minor sort of way that might be true a lot of the time but it's also true that you know very often the people who are just acknowledged uh, might have made sort of small but crucial contributions towards the making of a study right um in this particular tale there is no real paper trail the paper was submitted at nature it went through review quite smoothly um but in other cases you know papers could go through many journals before they finally published and in the process of peer review they could undergo a lot of change um so there's a postscript to the study in addition to asking scientists about um 
what the, the backstory of the study and the making of the study itself. I also asked them about what has happened after the study was published. Now, now this paper um, has been cited over 2000 times, 2143 times as of today, which for this field of ecology and evolution is a fairly high number of times. And like I said, it's also this paper is thought to mark the beginning of this area of research called biodiversity ecosystem function. But what's really interesting is to see what Shahid Naeem feels about this paper uh, when I spoke to him in the interview. Uh, he says, apart from saying that this question has been of interest for 22 years, there is not much reason to cite our 1994 paper. There are better studies today. If you wanted to say that biodiversity effects consist of selection and complementarity, which he's referring to the actual mechanisms through which biodiversity influences ecosystem function. So he says, if you wanted to say that biodiversity effects consist of selection and complementarity, you would probably go to a different paper, Hector and Loru, or something more recent. If you wanted to say that biodiversity influences nitrogen cycling, you could go to a couple of other papers because they did bigger experiments and they were outdoors and so mimic nature more closely. So he says our paper is mostly of historical interest. And in another paper, in, an, in another part, of the interview, he actually says that, you know, I have no doubt that if this paper was submitted today, it would be rejected because it leaves out so many things that we know today are really, really important, right? Um, so going back to where we start started, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, the gap between what scientists do and how they present what they do. And uh, I hope that, you know, this paper, Naeem et al. 1994, provides an, one illustration of that gap and what published scientific papers tend to leave out, right? But I also want to approach this uh, question in a more sort of synthetic way by looking at uh, one particular aspect of, uh, you know, the doing of science that gets left out of published papers, right? Um, there's been a lot of discussion and you, each of you probably has your own favorite example of, you know, serendipitous discovery in science. Um, um, but, you know, we could think of chance in a broader way, not just in terms of discovery, but uh, chance events that influence uh, scientific uh, research at different steps in the process itself. So when I think of, when I, when I say chance events, what I mean is um, an unplanned occurrence that had a substantial or significant bearing on the way the study was done, right? Uh, and so what I wanted to do was to, across all these interviews that I've done, try and identify such chance events to see how frequently do they occur, what nature do these chance events take, and you know what steps of the research process do they affect, right? So, but it's important to point out that this is based on what the scientists themselves said um, in, in retrospect, in reflection, about the particular events that they think had uh, an influence on their studies, right? This is not does not come from an independent um, evaluation of these papers and uh, evaluation of these studies itself. So it's from the scientists onwards. Um, so just to give you a summary of that, uh, what I did was to look at 62 papers, empirical papers. These are well-known papers in ecology and evolution and the interviews associated with them. And I tried to look at you know, um, mentions of chance events in the interviews linked to these papers, right? So what you see in the rows is different kinds of chance events. So for example, unexpected tip would be, or would be something that an individual suggested to uh, one of the authors of the paper that had a significant bearing on how the study was done or written up. A natural history observation, which is, you know, specifically of interest in ecology and evolution studies is, is, is an observation of something in nature that triggered either the study itself or something about how the study was done. And so like that, if you go down, you can think, so collaborations that came about by chance, uh, certain practical considerations, like for instance, the choice of site might have been dictated by, you know, logistics or earlier studies on that particular, uh, in that particular place for something else. Uh, and so I looked at different sources of chance events and the steps in the research process that they affected. And from that, across 62 papers, what we find is that there we could record about 120 events that could be considered chance events that had a significant bearing on the conduct of that study. Now, what this number means, whether it's a high number or a low number, 
is uh, really difficult to say. There isn't really anything to compare it with, but uh, at least what you can say from this is that um, there are, you know, at least a couple of chance events per paper on average that seem to have substantial bearing on the study. And if there's some initial indications of which steps in the process are affected more. For instance, motivation seems to be a step that's affected a lot by chance events. Uh, there's also differences in terms of the source of chance events. So this is a preliminary uh, analysis of chance events in these interviews, um, which I would like to sort of do more formally as I go along. But uh, the point I want to make here is that none of these find any mention in the empirical, the final scientific papers that are published, right? So it's only from finding out the backstories of these papers, do you get to know about these, these crucial incidents or events that had a significant bearing on how the study was conducted. Uh, and just to give you a few examples of this, so this is a video that some of you might have seen uh, of this capuchin monkey uh, being offered. So there are two monkeys, um, in one in each cage and um, both of them initially are offered uh, a piece of cucumber and then what the researcher does is to offer one of the monkeys a grape which is considered a better food and continue to offer one of the monkeys a cucumber and uh, the video has become really popular and viral because of the reaction of the monkey that's continued to offer the cucumber because it sees that the other monkey is receiving a grape and gets really agitated and frustrated and at one point throws the cucumber back at the researcher so the study on which this experiment was based is titled Monkeys Reject Unequal Pay, and it's done by Sarah Brosnan and Franz Duval. And when I interviewed Sarah Brosnan, she said that the way she came upon this observation and decided to test it empirically was that when they were, she was just feeding the monkeys one day, and typically what happens is that when they're feeding the monkeys, the dominant monkey tries to sort of monopolize all the food. And so the way she would get around this was to hold her hand out uh, for, you know, with the food, a peanut for the dominant monkey away from the other hand and with the other hand feed the other monkeys when the dominant monkey is distracted. But she wouldn't give the dominant monkey the peanut, right? And she said that on one, in one instance, the dominant monkey became really agitated. So it ran in and brought out a piece of, first a piece of cucumber to give the researcher in exchange for the peanut, but she still refused. Then it went in and got a piece of orange peel and to exchange for the peanut, but the researcher still refused. Finally, it went in and got a piece of orange for the researcher to exchange for the peanut. And this is when she it really got her thinking because, you know, monkeys generally value oranges much more than peanuts. And but here this monkey was offering her the orange in exchange for the peanut. And so that got her thinking that, you know, what what is happening here is that monkey wants the peanut because the others are being offered the peanut. Uh, and not because of its intrinsic value. And so got to thinking about some sense of fairness that these monkeys have and led to this study, which has become very, very well known since then. So natural history observations like this have been the triggers for many studies, just chance natural history observations. Um, in this study, uh, there was an unplanned collaboration, right? This is a study looking at the how whether peahens prefer peacocks with elaborate trains. This is a well-known study in the field of sexual selection, which uh, sort of demonstrated that the peacock's uh, tail was something that the peahens used to evaluate the quality of the male. And uh, Marion Petri, who's the first author of this paper, talks about how you know she gave a talk in the zoology department in Oxford, and uh, somebody in the audience, this person called Alan Graffin, who's a well-known theoretician, came up to her at the talk and offered to analyze the data, which is then presented in the paper. So this came about completely in an unplanned way. Um, the third example is of something that a change in the paper that happened at the stage of peer review. So this is a paper that is titled Distribution of the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly, uh, Evidence for a Meta Population Model. And Susan Harrison in her interview talks about how the title for the paper was something else. And she says, Jared Diamond in the signed review said the paper was better than he expected it to be from the pedestrian sounding title, which was originally meta population dynamics for the bay of the bay checker spot butterfly. We adopted the alternative title he suggested. So the title of the paper actually came about because of a comment in the peer review itself. And finally, um, there have also been cases where, you know, there's been some influence of 
some things happening outside of academia which had a really strong bearing on how a particular study was conducted and this is a really good example of that this is another study looking at what's called sexual selection where anderson multi anderson was looking at whether the tail of the male widow bed bird is uh, is something that the females use to decide which males to mate with right and he talks about how so he did experiments where he would cut off the tail of the bird um and along with the tails of some other birds by sticking the tail using a glue and he talks about how this was possible only because at this point in time when he was starting to do these experiments a particular kind of glue entered the market which allowed this him to do these experiments it was and since then this this is the first study that used this experimental procedure of sticking you know bits of tail to the bird uh, but since then there have been other studies that have used similar sorts of methods right so these are just some examples of the ways in which chance events have influenced um the making of these studies but uh, in all of these cases you don't find any of this information in the published paper itself okay so i've already gone well beyond my allotted time so i'll i'll quickly summarize what i want to sort of take away from this so one question to ask of course at the end of all of this is so what so you know the scientific paper in its current form has a particular purpose it's to communicate um the findings and interpretations of the study the arguments in the study in as clear a way as possible right uh, yes it does leave out all of this detail but does that really matter right uh, these stories one could say these stories are interesting but does it matter for our understanding either of science historically or for our the contemporary practice of science so when it comes to our understanding of the history of science i think uh, there is a clearer answer that yes of course it matters because you know uh, if you think of papers like journalism is the first draft of history if you think of papers as the first draft of the history of science these papers do not really tell you about how science is done yes historians go and look at archives and they you know and they don't depend only on scientific papers but uh, a lot of you know scientists today um, will only the, their scientific legacies will often only consist of the papers they publish right very few of them will have other sort of material associated with them and therefore if you have to build histories of particular scientists based on what they publish then it is true that the scientific papers do not do a good job of communicating how these scientists actually worked um but what does it matter for the conduct of science itself you know richard feynman the physicist um one said that um, i think he said it in the context of philosophy of science he said that philosophy of science is as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds right meaning you know it doesn't really matter to scientists it's a different discipline and it doesn't affect the uh, the practice of science in any way um which is true meaning i don't think historians of scientists are doing what they do in order to improve a better how science is done historians of scientists are studying science itself science is their object of study but uh, can we in 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 what we have been discussing in addition to being useful for history of science um what is the current form and content of the scientific paper what does that mean for uh, our teaching and learning of science for instance right um, and i would say that um because science that you see in textbooks and science that is taught in classes mostly come from scientific papers it creates a certain model of how science is done among students right that um, everything is sort of logical that there are no sort of failures there are no mistakes uh, it's only as you go along and start doing research yourself you realize that all of these are uh, you know part of doing science but my question is you know how does it affect who then chooses to become chooses research as a career and who decides not to based on this sort of um, misunderstanding of how science is done right maybe a different set of people who would otherwise not choose to do science might do science if they are aware of you know uh, have a better understanding of how science is actually done and not just what is present in textbooks and in the papers um 
And finally, in terms of the practice of science itself, you know, um, given what we saw in terms of the role of chance events in the making of science, um, what what is this understanding of how science is done? What does it mean for how science is funded, for instance? Right. So, if we do in fact find that chance events have a really important role to play. How might that change the way we think about science funding? Would we allow for more flexibility in the way science is done? Would we allow for if we are, if we realize that chance affects science at particular research, particular steps in the research process, in in particular ways, if there are particular sources of chance that are important, how might that change the way we think about how science is funding? Right now, it seems very often when it comes to scientific funding, especially today, that it's almost as if you have had to have done the study already before. Uh, you know, actually raising the the money like, you know, everything needs to have been worked out in a sense that's inevitable given how many people are doing science today, but um, the other ways in which we can make space for um, research that is uh, not so tightly tied to specific outcomes that allows for a more a more creativity and more the ability to, you know, make mistakes and so on. Um, in terms of specific uh, steps that maybe could be taken um, to tie and tell these stories. I think with publications moving away from hard copies to mostly, you know, going digital, there is the opportunity. Now space is not so much of a constraint anymore. So there is the opportunity for people to tell the stories of their science a lot more. And you're already seeing that many journals allow scientists to tell the backstories of their science, but it's usually separate. So there is the backstory and then the the paper itself and they seem like two separate things other ways in which papers themselves could evolve to be able to capture the making of science in a way that more uh, accurately um, to in the way that you know captures accurately how the science is actually made instead of you know um, sort of sterilizing the story of how the study was made so i think publications going digital maybe offer the opportunity for um, a closer for sort of closing this gap between how uh, between what scientists actually do and how they communicate what they've done. So I'll um, end with that. Um, I'd just like to thank a few people before I take questions if there are any. Um, firstly, two individuals, uh, Vidyadar, who has been a close friend over now over uh, 15, 17 years, um, who was the first to sort of uh, motivate me to maybe think about this and tell the story of my own paper um, in this regard. Uh, he said that, you know, we keep hearing about what is found in science. We don't hear so much about how it's actually done. And uh, I think that that conversation with him was particularly important many years ago. Uh, Seth Barabu was uh, a colleague of mine at the, this place in Berlin that I spent a few months at. So I was doing what I just described to you with my own paper and Seth uh, very frankly pointed out that, you know, yes, it's all fine that you tell the story of your own paper, but I don't think many people are going to be interested in the story of your paper. Why don't you pick, you know, better known papers to tell this story? And so I thank Seth for that. Vishwesha, who's um, at the Center for Ecological Sciences and was my postdoc supervisor. Um, I should thank him for many things, but mainly because, you know, for a large part of my time in his lab, I was doing working on this project and what I, not what I was supposed to do or not what I said I would do when I joined this lab and he was perfectly happy with allowing me to do that. Um, so three institutes where I've continued to work on this project, the Wissenschafts colleague in Berlin, the NCBS wildlife program and the archives at NCBS where I've spent postdoctoral time. The Indian National Science Academy uh, supported me with a fellowship over the last uh, three years. And of course, finally, all the interviewees who I was very, very surprised, pleasantly surprised by, you know, uh, the fact that most of them were willing to spend uh, time, you know, answering my questions over a Skype phone call or over email. And so I thank all of them. And again, thank all of you for attending. Thank you, Hari, for this very interesting lecture. Uh, we'll take some questions. Yeah. So uh, we can right. do one thing. Uh, can, can you, yeah, we'll have a raised hands. And after I call out your name, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. So I see two hands. Um, Should I stop sharing? Yeah, you can stop sharing. Okay. So may I ask uh, Rohini Golbode, ma'am, to 
ask a question. You can first unmute, yeah. Okay. And thank you very much for a very interesting talk, Harish. Uh, I wanted to know whether you have any plans of talking to uh, people who do physical or mathematical sciences because uh, some of the lessons might be quite different, particularly mathematics. So wanted to yeah. know what you think about this. Yeah, like, I mean, of what you said or what you heard and talked uh, to people experienced was uh, due to the particular discipline you were looking at. Yeah, th th thank you for that question. Uh, mathematics and physical sciences is way out of my comfort zone. So the reason um, I chose to focus on ecology and evolution is because I come from this field. And so I'm, I'm able to understand the, the papers based on which I'm conducting these interviews. So I yeah, I don't have any plans to conduct interviews in these other disciplines. But uh, a few people have written, not from mathematical sciences, but from other disciplines. Um, like from the social sciences, from forestry, I have written asking if uh, you know they'd be interested in doing similar projects in their own disciplines, and um, and have been in touch with me in terms of discussing how to go about doing something like that. So I'd be happy to you know sort of um, discuss how to do similar. I mean, it really doesn't require much. I mean, there's a set of questions that I've uh, like a template that I use to ask these questions and. I'm happy to share it with anyone who wants to do similar interviews in uh, other fields. Um, but but you're right. I, I think that the responses will be very different um, in other fields. I think uh, I guess what I wanted to know is that I mean this is a very unique exercise you have done. Whether there have been others who have been interested in analyzing the process of science the way you have done, and whether there are any differences in the experiences of. Uh, analyzing mathematicians and physicists. I guess I miss didn't represent my question quite well. Yeah, I, I, I'm yeah, I, I'm not aware of uh, a similar exercise in mm -hmm. mathematics, but uh, there have been um, attempts in uh, other fields of uh, biology that I'm aware of, like collections of uh, papers, not not so much in the form of interviews, but where the scientists themselves have revisited their papers and written a reflective essay on their um, their papers they published in the past. So for example, there are uh, collections of um, Robert Rivers papers or um, Bill Hamilton's papers, which were put together many years after they were published and sort of each paper was prefaced with a reflective interview by the author. But but I'm not I'm not aware of similar uh, collections in in other disciplines. Thank you very much again as i said it makes one think and that's that's really what i think any analysis and any talk uh, thank you that's the merit so thanks again thank you uh, okay the next question can be from ashish yoglikar then we can have a kartik question hello thank you for that wonderful talk i have just one question so uh, is it the reviewer's responsibility who is expected to be an expert in the field to ask for say that missing experimental detail like choice of light source or the wavelength because it seems to directly impact the outcome so should the reviewer should he have asked for that uh, detail yeah that's a good point i i think uh, the it's changed quite a bit even in the so this paper was published in 94 um, today, if someone submitted a paper without those details, I am sure uh, the reviewer would ask for those details to be included, right? But um, even today, uh, I think there are still many details that have to do with, you know, just the way to just getting experiments or field methods working that uh, just from a reading of uh, a draft, a manuscript, the review might not be able to tell that these are important details missing, right? Uh, I think it only comes from speaking to the interview when he or she says, the interviewee, the author, when he or she says that this was crucial, that you realize that it was crucial for the conduct of the experiment or the study. But, but you're right in saying that these particular details that I highlighted, mm -hmm. that if they were missing in a paper submitted today, they would definitely be flagged. Yeah, thanks. Maybe you need an interdisciplinary panel of reviewers who have <laughs> expertise in many of these areas. <laughs> yeah. 
Karthik, go ahead. Then we can have Professor Sridham's question. Karthik. Uh, okay. Karthik, are you there? Okay, I think it's frozen or something. Uh, can we have Professor Sridham's question? Hi, uh, thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, I was very, very curious about this. Uh, you, uh, the article you mentioned where the journals said, take the following people's names off. How on earth did that happen? Was enough detail? You mentioned one article where the, the technical person's names, the journal actually said it should be off. I mean, that means that the roles of each author was spelled out in such detail that the journal could look at it and say, you shouldn't have this on there. I've never heard of that before. Is that? Yeah, it, I was surprised by that too. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have more detail on that. So what what the interviewee Shahid Naeem said was that they'd included the names of the, all the engineers, the technicians as authors. Mm -hmm. And um, what the journal said was that given, uh, he must have described the specific roles that they played and what the journal said was given how you have described their specific contributions, they don't qualify for authorship. Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's unusual. Very odd. Uh, one general comment uh, is that you know this the, the formal hypothesis testing, you know official scientific method way of doing things is actually typically not how physical science experimental or theoretical work is done because yeah. you usually have access to the entire internal works and mechanisms. You don't say we hypothesize, uh, we make the following null hypothesis, and then with this confidence. Anyway. So in that sense, the whole story, if you dig it up. For mm -hmm. almost any physics paper, very different from uh, from what you have in. Uh, okay. That's exactly what I mentioned. Um, yeah. 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 Exactly I, what I was right. I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. So this yeah. is probably more um, true of uh, biological sciences. Right. Uh, and I, I don't know about other disciplines, but yeah, definitely for biological sciences, this is the way most papers are framed. But I was right. thanks for that. I wasn't aware that it's very different in physical sciences. It's Actually, true. it's even true. same thing is true in mathematical sciences too. I mean, so okay. there, there, there is no experiments to speak of. But uh -huh. Okay. Then. Thank you. Thanks. Karthik, do you want to ask your question? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Hari. This is Karthik from also from the Office of Communications. Unfortunately, I'm on IAC's Wi-Fi, and the connection is not particularly good. Um, so if I'm not able to finish my question. Then you can move on to the next uh, question. Uh, can you hear me though? I can hear you, yes, Karthik. Okay. Uh, so um, one of the things that I thought was missing from your so what slide, uh, which I'm sure you have thought about, is the ethical angle associated with uh, the backstory or not providing the backstory of uh, a scientific discovery. Um, so, I mean, a more one extreme example. The Robert Millikan's oil drop experiment, right, where we know much, we learned much later on that he left out. Yeah. Um, but you can even think of stories like Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin. He was just a careless researcher. He went on a holiday and he allowed mold to grow on uh, Staphylococcus culture, right? But he was very open and he talked about it. But it did require an investigative journalist digging into the backstory. So I was wondering during the course of your hundred odd interviews, did you encounter uh, any such issues and whether people were willing to talk about it? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I yeah, I, I really think that this is just this. The interviews that I've done should really be treated just as one source, and I, I think they should be treated more as as hypothesis worth um, investigating further, right? Because there are so many possible sources of bias. The, these are the author's own reflections, the questions of memory, the questions of how authors want to represent themselves that 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 come into this, right? Um, so yes, uh, it's very difficult just from the interview to be able to tell uh, whether um, there are other issues, whether people are leaving out what they're saying. But I do know for a couple of cases where uh, you know, I've spoken to the author and also there have been sort of independent investigations into the history of these projects 
that there there is occasionally a mismatch between what the way the author is representing. For example, one one area in which they come up is that comes up is I often ask the authors about you know what's the status of their findings and interpretations today, given that so much time has passed. Um, and in at least a couple of cases, the authors believe that it stands perfectly well even today. But you know from other work that that's not the case, right? Uh, so there have been cases like this, but but I really think that these the what the interviews do mainly is just to provide um, you know um, routes along which you know other people who are interested in investigating the histories of these these research areas can go, like because all of them need further validation through um, you know maybe looking at archival material through sort of triangulating by speaking to other authors on the same paper i've spoken only to the primary author but it'll be useful for you know at least for a subset of these papers to speak to uh, other authors on the paper itself to see if um, there is uh, they are all saying the same thing or they remember the uh, project in the same way thanks Uh, Priya, Priya, do you have a question? Yes, Priya, yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I do. Hi, Hari. Uh, Hi, great talk. Uh, so I also had a question about the so what and uh, something that you may have uh, briefly alluded to, but um, that was um, uh, quite stark for me from your talk was um, so many of these things that you cover in the backstories are actually do get talked about if you are in the community of the researchers doing some of this work, right? So if you are a graduate student um, in ecology and evolution in the US or in Europe, you probably get to hear many of these stories, but it's not accessible to, let's say a student interested in ecology in a government college in India, right? So it's outside of the circles where this work gets done, um, these stories are generally not available at all. I mean, this is changing now with people writing blogs and uh, putting more stuff up informally, but I feel like that's a big part of the so what of what you're doing, right? Like who gets to do this work? Um, mm -hmm. And so even a discipline like ecology and evolution, which is so relevant across the world, is done in this formal manner by a very limited subset of countries, you know? So, and is that partly because these stories are not getting reported? Yeah, that was me. Um, yeah, I think I, maybe I briefly alluded to this when I was talking about what it means for teaching and education. Um, but I, I think what, what the interviews, or at least what I presented here, um, did not cover is, you know, the the circumstances that really allowed for these people to do the work that they did, right? That the, the larger circumstances, um, you know, especially given my focus on, you know, well-known landmark papers in ecology and evolution, uh, a lot of uh, or what this comes down to is just, uh, you know sort of good fortune, like being at the right place at the right time. Many of these authors are willing to acknowledge that, that um, they were fortunate, one, that they were able to, they had everything in uh, easily available for them to be able to do these studies, but also more importantly, that they were fortunate that these papers became so well recognized and and therefore they were able to, you know, it, it really helped them in their careers. Um, and I think, um, these stories about how, um, where they are and where they come from and how that has had an influence on uh, how successful these papers have become. I think those are important stories to, to tell, right? Uh, and I, I, they are there in the larger set of interviews to some extent, but I must acknowledge that I started thinking about this uh, to get the bigger context of these studies. I was very, when I started, I was very focused on the, the individual paper and you know sort of restricting all my questions to um, details of the paper itself but um, as i went along in the in the second or third year of the project i would also talk about the larger context of you know leading up to the point when they did the study uh, what what was it that facilitated them being able to do the study 
and i think those stories are probably more important and useful uh, for uh, to answer your question to you know to, to think about why is it that uh, ecology and evolution still gets done only in certain countries gets done more by certain kinds of people and so on okay uh, Tatasta, are there any other questions? Uh, I don't see any other question. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I think Kartik has another question. Go ahead, Kart. Uh, yeah, I can ask another question. If there are not. Um, so I just wanted to. Um, so if you look at the history of the research paper, right? If you look at the very old papers, even papers published in journals like Nature. You see people talking about how they were out on a rainy day and looking for something and found something else. And it's a very, very subjective personal story that you would see in papers in the 1600s and 1700s. And that changed over time, especially in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So besides uh, people like you who are interested in the history of, um, of scientific discoveries, is there also a role for the research paper to tell a little more of uh, of the backstory, maybe go not necessarily. We went from being subjective to not necessarily objective, but we try to standardize the format. But are you making the case that maybe the research paper itself could be uh, there could be a little more flexibility in its format? Yes, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm definitely making the case that there, there can be more flexibility in the format of research papers, especially today. Um, I think, you know, um, Journals have decided that papers need to be structured in a certain way. I think what needs what they should maybe allow is a little more freedom for the reviewers to take a call on whether details such as this, um, you know, hamper the understanding of the paper, right? So the starting point when people submit the draft itself is a paper that has left out all uh, all these details, but maybe journals could encourage people to submit papers with these details and then see, you know, let the peer reviewers take a call on uh, how much of this detail, uh, you know, is uh, just distracts from understanding the, the point of the paper. And but if it, if it doesn't, then I think really uh, there should be the possibility for people to include such information. Uh, it's happening now in us in, you know, like I said, separately, right? So journals have the paper and then a blog associated with the journal where people can tell the backstories of the paper. Like for instance, this journal called Nature, Ecology and Evolution has that. Every author is given the opportunity to tell the backstory of his or her paper. Um, and so, but I think there is space maybe in the paper itself for uh, some, at least some of these details to be included. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Is there any last question? OK. Maybe hurry, we can uh, you know, call it a day. OK, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Bittasa, and thank you all again for attending and listening. Thank you, Hari. Thank you for, for this interesting lecture. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And we'll meet soon again. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.